Hi, I'm Jay John. Welcome to the Just 10 series here in London. We're looking at God's 10 commandments and we're going to focus on the sixth commandment, do not murder. And the title is how to manage our anger. to manage our anger. There was a couple that had been married for 50 years and they were interviewed about their marriage. And one of the questions in the interview was, during the 50 years of your marriage, have you ever thought of divorce? And the man said, divorce? No, murder. <laughs> Well, the sixth commandment reads, do not murder. Exodus 20, verse 13. Murder is a serious crime because once done, it cannot be undone. The phrase road rage entered the English language in 1997. Road rage is a term used to describe our reactions to those we feel are unqualified and unsuitable to drive. 42% of employees reported that yelling and verbal abuse took place in their workplace. And 23% have been driven to tears. Most people do not know how to manage their anger. Did you know that we can break this commandment by passive inaction? If we send a person away naked, when we could have clothed them, we may have let them freeze to death. If we see anyone suffer from hunger and do not feed them, we may have let them starve to death. The commandment mandates us to pursue those things that preserve and enhance life. The sixth commandment deals with the protection and the sanctity of all human life at every stage of development from conception until natural death. According to the World Health Organization, 73 million abortions take place worldwide every day year. Now just process that particular statistic. 73 million babies are aborted every year. Abortion is wrong even if it is a right. You see, Abortion does not prevent a woman from becoming a mother. Abortion makes a woman the mother of a dead baby. Christianity teaches that life is valuable from the moment of conception and the child in the womb expresses consciousness pain and humanness. If any of you have had an abortion, it will be good to pause at this moment now and pray for you. And I'm going to ask my wife, Killy, if she would come and pray some prayers that are relevant 
regarding abortion. Let's pray. Father God, show your mercy to every woman who has had an abortion. We pray healing for any pain, guilt, fear, loss, and grief they may feel. We pray each woman's heart, mind, and soul is healed of their past decision and actions. We give you each child and may they rest in your loving care. If any woman was forced into the decision by their partners or parents, please help them to forgive them. We also pray for any partners or parents here to receive your forgiveness and healing. Amen. Amen. Jesus' interpretation of the sixth commandment included not only acts that cause death, but also actions and attitudes that can cause harm. You have heard that it was said, do not murder. And if you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, Jesus said, that anyone who is angry with someone without cause will be subject to judgment. Matthew 5, verse 21. Grudges, resentment, prejudice, racism, bitterness, and hatred harm life. And sometimes our language is full of deadly venom. I wish you'd never been born. Drop dead kind of attitude. We say, if looks could kill. Now, in a sense, looks can kill. Rage and hatred are murderous things. They distort our demeanor so that even our very faces reflect death. And when it's written all over your face, well, you don't have to say anything. A very thin line separates violence of feeling from violence of action. And married couples will argue, and they will, they will say things like, I hate you. I never loved you. I don't know why I married you. Often, the people we get angry at the most are those we are closest to. There are three common expressions of anger. One, the maniac. The maniac, these are the <laughs> exploders. They blow up. They throw things. They yell. They rage. They shout. They spill all over. Sibling rivalry was the cause of humanity's first murder. In a fit of jealousy and anger, Cain killed his brother Abel. Now, temper is one thing that you cannot get rid of by losing. Now, maniacs put their mouth into gear before they engage their mind. Blessed are the flexible, for they will not be bent out of shape. <laughs> the maniac, one. Two, the mute, the mute. Denial, it's repressed. And some people don't like to admit that they're angry. They conceal how they feel. And some people stoically put on a very good front and pretend not to be angry at all. Who? Me? I'm not angry. 
What gives you that impression? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's obvious. Now, people who operate with repressed anger, they hold on to the anger, swallowing the pain. And when we bury the anger, we are burying it alive. Usually, it's our body that feels the effects of repressed anger. The philosopher Seneca in 50 AD wrote this, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. The maniac, the mute, the manipulator. The manipulator retaliates in an underhand way. Sarcasm, jibes, little insults, hurtful humour. And people with resentment and resentful anger, they get their feelings hurt, but they never get over it. Think how a single incident can get neighbours embroiled in a conflict that causes them to be enemies for years. Family members often hold resentful anger for a lifetime. The maniac, the mute, the manipulator. Which one of those are you? Or are you a little bit of each? <laughs> the big question is this. How do we manage our anger? Okay, let me give you the principles. Principle number one, I need to admit my anger. Principle one, please repeat, I need to admit my anger. You see, when we have to swallow our own medicine, the spoon seems very large, doesn't it? But we need to admit it to ourselves, we need to admit it to maybe our partner, and we need to admit it to God. And we make things worse when we pretend it's not a problem. Now, in the Bible, the word angry, anger, is actually used 455 times. 375 of those occasions, it refers to God's anger. Jesus himself was enraged with justifiable anger with the money changers in the temple. Now, of course, there is legitimate anger. Even God got angry. But we must not sin. The issue is not how are we going to get rid of all this anger, but how can we express it in a non-destructive way? I need to admit my anger, and I need to admit if I can't control it. Principle one. Principle two, I need to deal with anger immediately. Principle two, I need to deal with anger immediately. You cannot shake hands with a clenched fist. Don't hold on to it. Don't let it turn into a grudge. People who fight fire with fire usually end up with the ashes. The Bible says this, Ephesians 4 verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. You see, when we hold on to anger, it opens us up to evil implications. We do odd things to get even with people. The Bible says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And that is a great Bible verse for husbands and wives. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Because if we go to bed angry, we lie down and all that anger starts 
eating us like a parasite. Hot heads and cold hearts never solved anything. It takes more inner strength to forgive than it does to inflict revenge. And sometimes we need to let God exercise justice. So principle one, I need to admit my anger. Principle two, I need to deal with anger immediately. Principle two, I need to deal with anger immediately. Principle three, I need to understand anger. Anger is usually covering a hurt. And if you look under the hurt, you will find an expectation. And if you look under the expectation, you will find there's a need. And so a sequence of irritating events can build up pressure until finally a relatively insignificant incident can trigger an eruption. You know, so maybe you're, you're annoyed, angry with your parents or your in-laws. And then your partner gets the entire lot dumped on them. And there's an eruption. Whether we're, we are on the road or we are in a, an, an argument, when we see red, it's time to stop. So we need to understand anger. Principle four, I need to stop and think before I speak. Principle four, I need to stop and think before I speak. Speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and the Bible says in James chapter one, verse 19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Again, the Bible in Proverbs 15 verse one, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. You see, the problem with anger, it seldom gives us what we want. And it usually does the exact opposite. I need to admit my anger. I need to deal with anger immediately. I need to understand anger. I need to stop and think before I speak. Fifth principle, I need to ask God to fill me with his Holy Spirit. Principle five, I need to ask God to fill me with his Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So I, I need to be filled with his Holy Spirit. When the pressure is on us and we get squeezed by irritations, inconveniences, and interruptions, whatever is inside of us, is going to come out. Society says the lawbreaker is a criminal. Jesus said every criminal act begins in the heart. Society tries to reform people, but Jesus can transform people. From hate to love, from bitterness to forgiveness, from darkness to light. The sixth commandment, do not murder. Murder is the ultimate form of anger. We must guard our anger and keep it under control. Don't let it get to the point that we take someone's life. Have you committed murder? Have you committed murder in your heart? 
Have you committed murder with your words? Do you need to get a handle on your anger? Would you like to have your life filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit? It's a choice. And God gives us that choice. We've probably all broken this commandment in one way or another. Whether it's in words, whether it's in attitudes, whether it's in facial expressions, or whether it's in more violent ways. The amazing thing is this, that God forgives even murder if we are repentant. In the Bible, a man called Moses, who was the one that was given the Ten Commandments, murdered. A man called King David murdered another man in order to cover his adultery. And a man called Paul in the New Testament, he murdered Christians. Moses murdered, King David murdered, Paul murdered, but God took three ex-murderers to write most of the Bible. <laughs> Not bad. That's pretty encouraging for murderers, isn't it? <laughs> now, if that is true for Moses, if that is true for David, if that is true for Paul, it can be true for us. 2,000 years ago, God allowed his son to be murdered. Now, I may hurt other people by my attitudes and my actions. I may even hurt myself by my attitudes and my actions. But most of all, I hurt God. Because my attitudes and my actions crucified Jesus Christ. A previous Archbishop of Milan, he told this story. He said, many years ago, there were three teenagers outside the cathedral in Milan. One of the three teenagers said, oh, why don't we go into the cathedral, go into the confession box, and uh, just tell the priest a load of obscene things. So one of the other two says, oh, I'll go. So he rushes into the cathedral, goes into the confession box. The priest says, what do you want to confess? So he starts telling him some very inappropriate things to try and shock the priest. But the priest wasn't shocked at all. He listened and listened. He said, OK, have you finished? Yes, I have. He says, right, what I want you to do is I want you to walk out of the cathedral, walk down the steps, turn around, look up at the cathedral. You'll see a huge crucifix. I want you to point to the crucifix and I want you to say, I don't care. So the youngster runs out of the cathedral, runs out, bumps into his two friends, and they were like, did you tell him? Did you tell him? Goes, yeah, I told him, I told him. Well, what did he say? Well, he told me to do something. Well, what did he tell you to do? He goes, well, I'll do it now. So he turns around, looks up, he sees this huge crucifix of Jesus hanging on a cross, and he pointed to the crucifix, about to say, I don't care, and he couldn't say it. He just couldn't say it because he knew the story. And he knelt down in front of his two friends and he began to weep. And he began to confess what he'd done and what he'd said. And he asked for forgiveness. And he got up off his knees, transformed. The Archbishop of Milan, he told that story. He then said this, I know that that story is true because I was that teenager. Many people have discovered throughout the centuries this transforming power that Jesus can give. Have you encountered Jesus, the only one who can set us free and transform us. 
take us out of darkness into light? Have you committed murder? Have you aborted a baby? Have you committed murder in your heart? Have you committed murder with your words? Do you need to get a handle on your anger? Research says that husbands batter one in four wives. One in four are battered by their husbands or their partners. Are you one of those? If you are, you need help. And if you're the spouse, you may need some healing. Are you prejudiced? Are you racist? Are you harboring violence just below the surface? Washing machines have a device called an agitator. And despite all the detergent, the fabric softener, the rinse cycle, the water, the one thing that ensures clean clothes is called the agitator. The agitator makes sure that dirty clothes become clean. Have you been agitated as you've listened? Well, that's God. And God, by his spirit, because of Jesus, wants to break into your life. Will you welcome him in? If you would like to do that, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, I know I have broken your commandments. I'm so thankful to you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you now to forgive me, cleanse my life, set me free from the past. I open the door of my life now. I invite you in. Fill me with your peace, your presence, your power. Help me from this day on to build my life on you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Amen.